welcome to the Cult of the Clock Tower. I am Andrew Nathanson. Every other week, a special guest and I have an in-depth discussion about a character from the game Blood on the Clock Tower. Today's character is the Clockmaker, a townsfolk from the Sex and Violets edition, whose ability reads, You start knowing how many steps from the demon to nearest minion. All right, welcome back, everyone. Today I am joined once again by Justin. Hey, Justin, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty great. How are you doing? I'm excited to be back. Doing pretty well. Uh, This is going to be one of the earlier episodes. Excited to have you on for that. I feel like there's a lot of good things to talk about, and the Clockmaker is a really interesting character to talk about, I think, as one of the first ones to talk about. It's, you know, near the top of the script, or at the top of the script, I think. It's a First Night Info character, which is the only one in Sex and Violets. And yeah, there's a lot of established metas around the clockmaker, and there's a lot to go into as far as to what extent those are merited and to what extent they're overrated. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let, yeah, let's talk about clockmaker in general. You're playing as the clockmaker. What are you thinking about? Uh, what are your strengths? What are you trying to make sure doesn't happen or does? All the usual stuff. Yeah, I think I think the Clockmaker, I've gained a lot of newfound respect for it uh, after having played both as one and with one a few times. It, I feel sort of similarly to it as the chef, except that I feel like it's even more useful than the chef. Uh, and I, it's one of the things I've really liked about this podcast is it helps me sort of gain some new appreciation for some strategies you can do with, with seemingly limited information. The Clockmaker... Your information is can be game winning, I think. It isn't always, and of course in Sects and Violets, you have to always question whether your information is true, but really only one of the demons guarantees that it's false, which is the Vortox, and the other demon that could make it false is the Nodashi, and that's only if you're seated right next to a nodashi or you know uh, the poisoning neighbor if it's jumping over outsiders or what have you um so it's you can actually trust your information uh, quite quite strongly because you won't be able to have it vigor uh, vigor mortis poisoned and fangu doesn't poison in the first place and none of the minions poison so it's i feel like it's one of the very few characters that is almost always relevant uh and sometimes it can be used to uh, help identify a vortex uh, in conjunction with other things if you get like a really wild number but i think the biggest thing i'm thinking on night one after i get that information is it can be very helpful to either physically or mentally take down a list of each pair of players that is x seats apart based on your information and and really be tracking private conversations on that first day with that in mind. That's a, it seems like a lot, but it's really not too bad, especially if you're able to write it down or type it if you're playing an online game. Because you can start just crossing them out pretty quickly if, if they're just not talking to each other. But if you get one or two of those pairs that you notice talking on day one, if your information is right, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big tell. Yeah, and... On that topic, I wasn't actually going to bring this up yet, but I think it makes sense here. There are certain numbers that you can get that are just like much better than other numbers, which is an interesting thing about Clockmaker. It's fairly swingy based on the setup. So like in an eight player game, for instance, getting a four is super valuable because that means that that would be players on opposite sides of the circle. And that means that each person only has one other person who is four away from them rather than like if you go to one, they'd have two other people who are one away from them. So keeping in mind numbers like that, so like specifically a four in an eight player game, Sometimes, like, uh, you can't really get a 5 in a 10-player game because there's two minions, uh, so one of them's guaranteed to be closer than that. But getting a 5 in an 11-player game means that the two minions are seated next to each other and the demon's on the opposite side of the circle from them. So, like, keeping in mind things like that and really thinking about the implications of your information tells you, how, uh, like, how strong it is, and that can influence how you play with it. Like, if you have really strong info about that the demon and the minion are sitting on opposite sides of the circle or that the minions have to be sitting next to each other, like that 5 in an 11-player game I was saying, that might be a reason that you want to come out with your information earlier on so that you can guide the discussion a little bit more, just because there is more information there. Yeah, 
I think that sort of segues into something that I think is an interesting note of when to come out with your information, because I feel that at least a lot of the stream games, people are getting Clockmaker info out there very quickly. And I actually think it's one of the cases where not getting your info out there is can be beneficial because it lulls the evil team into a, a false sense of security that there's no mm-hmm. clockmaker uh, watching them. And I, I don't think you should keep it secret for a long time, but I can definitely justify keeping it secret for maybe the first two days, maybe even the first three. I know in our group, a lot of the time, the minion and demon won't talk to each other on day one because it's kind of easy to track but then on day two they're like well everybody's talking to everybody now so now i'll go coordinate but if they if they know there's a clockmaker out there especially if they know that there's a clockmaker with accurate information then they probably won't do that and (laughs) your information is still helpful but uh it loses some of its gotcha potency when you just put it out there so that everyone knows that everyone knows it i guess yeah i think the comparison to the chef is it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think the chef is very similar where there's a lot of, in a lot of groups, people will just come out with the chef info right away feeling like, I mean, Hey, there's this information, like it's not going to get any better, but the truth is it does get better because it influences how people play. Now, as far as whether or not it's like, you have, that's, it's always a trade off, right? Like if you don't come out with it early, then you have less time to act on that information. So like <laughs> if, if you think you know where a minion is, then you should probably def- like definitely come out with your information because that's going to allow you to make better informed decisions about who to execute to try to get the demon. But if you don't really know anything about everyone yet and you're still in the exploratory phase uh, of the game, then I feel like keeping it to yourself is can be really valuable, like you're saying. I think when we're talking about identifying a minion, uh, I think we're thinking uh, posthumously, right? Uh, if yeah, you if you know usually. that there's someone's a minion, you should just kill them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but if you figured out that a minion has died, uh, then that's a great time to start coming out with it because it's it by the time that happens, even if it's day one, it's kind of yeah, it's it's kind of past that point now, uh, and it depends on how they died, but. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that if you're pretty sure that a minion died at night because you have a vigor mortis, um, or rather sort of the opposite way around, if you think a minion died at night and that leads you to suspect a vigor mortis, then especially in a single minion game, that's a huge that's a huge boon to you because now you know that you know if if you have say an oracle that detects that some you know an evil player has died and you don't think it was who you executed now you know it's one of two players it's almost like a soft sage of mm-hmm. <laughs> of knowing your clockmaker info and that's also another reason that keeping it secret can be beneficial is because if everyone knows that there's a clockmaker especially if they know it's correct information which uh, much like the empath the evil team always knows if the clockmaker's information is correct because they know how many seats apart they are then a vigor mortis might not kill one of their minions at least not early because they know that it will lead it straight to them. But if you keep it a secret, then they might just do it night one and, you know, bing, bang, boom. Uh, the seemingly innocuous information is hugely impactful. Yeah. One of the characters that I've seen, I don't know why, it feels like it should happen more than this, but in my games, I've found that the Oracle doesn't actually get great information all that often. I don't know, that's probably just me um and just like the random luck of how my games have played out but i've hardly ever seen an oracle like get great information in the game but one place where the oracle is super good is combining with a clockmaker because knowing that an evil player is dead well there's only so many ways they could be evil that just always is going to interact with the clockmaker information uh and even in in a game with multiple minions knowing that one of them is dead still gives you a lot of information because like sure it's not as specific as in a one minion game where it's just going to tell you that one of two people is the demon uh it's now going to tell you that one of two people is the demon or it could still be somewhere else but in a bigger game you also have a bit more time to figure that out so it's still really good information anytime you can figure out that like where a minion is yeah i agree and i think probably part of what it comes down to with your oracle uh, talk is that in a vortex it's in a vortex game it's obviously never going to be helpful um or difficult to well, make helpful anyway. yeah <laughs> yeah because i mean it depends on how mean your storyteller wants to be but they can like keep showing you two for a long time yeah <laughs> <laughs> or something like that but 
between a Vortox and then if we're talking about coordinating between a Clockmaker and an, and an Oracle, that's two people that a Nodashi could poison, either one mm-hmm. of them. Uh, so, yeah, I, I can see how they might either get themselves killed because they don't have anything to offer up right away, or or it's increasing the odds that one of you is poisoned. So I, I can see how that could happen in those types of games. With uh... Yeah, I think an interesting thing with the Clockmaker is that your info is kind of dependent on the other stuff going on in the game. So even though your information itself is more rarely false than other people's information, you still have to, like, the people you're coordinating with are still going to be getting wrong information. So it's really important to try to figure out the rest of the things just for their sake so that it, it, they can contextualize your information. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just rereading some of our notes and a little extra point I wanted to mention. I think I sort of said it, but when you're trying to look at the pairs of players that match up to your information, it also means that once you clear a player as well as you can anyway, you can cross out two pairs, like that person and then each of their corresponding clock numbers. That doesn't clear the people that uh, are part of those pairs, but it at least clears those pairs as evil pairs, if that makes yeah, sense. as the pair you're looking for. Yeah, and really that just helps you not go crazy looking at tons and tons and tons of pairs uh (laughs) you can start at least crossing them out so that you're really only looking at you know three pairs remaining or something like that yeah Um, a a similar on a similar note whoever that like if you got a three whoever's three steps away from you is a bit less likely to be the demon than anyone else in the game right (laughs) it's that's obviously not like doesn't mean they're guaranteed not to be um, but that can at least be a starting point for you. Um, like if you have to make a decision between two people and one of them is your exactly your distance away from you, you know that that's one fewer pair they can be a part of. So if you're not sure between them, I would tend to go for the person people who aren't that far away from you. Yeah, it's also uh, can be helpful because even if it doesn't mean that they aren't evil, it means that if they are evil, you've narrowed out one of the two pairs because yeah. the other, you know, because you're one of them, which just helps you focus your information. I think, yeah, I, I, I am really liking the Clockmaker. The more I think about it, just because of how much sort of triangulation you do with your power, it's a very interesting way of thinking about the game. It's it's such a specific and strong piece of information. Like, uh, it's it's rare in this game to get information that where like once you know one person you definitely know another person and a lot of the time the clockmaker kind of works out like that so it is very strong it's just i mean there are lots of ways that it can get messed with as well and you have to keep that in mind like the demon can move the minions can move you obviously could be poisoned or it could be a vortex game overall it is a really strong piece of information i think also even though it may feel like your information becomes pointless if the demon moves or if you have a vortex at least in a Vortox game, you can guarantee that it's not your number, which mm-hmm. can, again, sort of do the inverse. You can build a list of pairs that can't be the the demon minion pair. Yeah. And if the demon moves either via Fangu or a Barber Swap or, God help you, a Pit Hag, um, <laughs> it at least helps you track the narrative, you know? And, and I think that that's really important in this set where so many things can feel so crazy that you don't even know where to start but even if your information doesn't tell you the the final answer if it helps you figure out the starting information and you can combine that with other information like which demon you have or which outsiders are in play or if a pit hag is creating outsiders it still helps you track down into a more specific finite set of worldviews and i think that that's really helpful yeah. So so at the start of the game, the tracking the minions is often uh it's pretty difficult to figure out where they are except for if there's an evil twin in the game. Uh evil twin with clockmaker is a really interesting combination. You basically just immediately start out with four demon targets. Unless it's like if it's a three minion game or something then you're a lot you, that's a lot less reliable, but in a one or a two min, even a two minion game, uh having an evil twin in the game immediately makes you a lot more powerful. That's also a reason to not necessarily reveal you're the clockmaker right away, because, like, say there's an evil twin pair, 
uh, specifically talking about a one-player game. Let's let's make it certain, and then you can sort of extend a weaker version of this argument out to a two-player, two-minion game or a three-minion game. Uh, so let's say you're it's a one-minion game, and that and somebody comes out as the evil twin right away. If you don't reveal that you're the clockmaker, the demon doesn't necessarily know that they have to kill, like, they have to, like, keep the players alive who are that far from the evil twin pairs. So they might just kill off some of the candidates for you and eventually narrow it down to themselves just on their own. So that can be a really strong thing, is just keeping that information to yourself, especially with an evil twin in the game. Yeah, and I also feel that that's sort of a sub point that we didn't directly talk about, but that's just another reason that it's helpful to keep your information hidden for yeah. a while is that if the candidates are dying, even if you don't know who the minion is, once you discover who the minion is, if say you got a two, while well, one of the people that's two seats away from the minion is already dead, then now you're already in great standing and they didn't know that it was bad to kill people, you know, clockmaker info steps away if you didn't tell them that. And so a lot of the time, either the town or the demon through night kills can narrow down your suspect pool because they don't know that they don't have to, or, you know, that they should worry about that. Um, it's just much more obvious with an evil twin game where one of them is loudly yeah. proclaiming, I am a minion or he is a minion, but <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and with that in mind, like as you get down to the, the very small numbers of players, have, like if you manage to hold on to your information and not have like a good time to reveal it throughout the entire game it is possible that you can get to a situation where like and this is also similar to the chef uh where the last people alive there's a pair of them that are exactly your distance away and then one person is just like off on their own and you, then you can evaluate at that point it's like okay do we think a minion survived this long and if so then you know at least one player you can trust and then you have to decide between the others yeah or or, or sort of the yeah, sort of the inverse of, of there's a player sitting alone out there and, you know, yeah, do we think, if I look, say, three steps away from that player on both sides, like, is there suspicion on either of those people as having been a minion? You know, yeah. You can, yeah. yeah. Or even like, even like there's one player who's on their own and then two players who are your distance away. Maybe you have good reason to trust those two players who are that distance away. And that really strongly then implies that the other person who's left is the demon. <laughs> Because, yeah, if, if you have, or even if you can just de trust one of those, I guess. Although, you know, they both have neighbors on the other side, uh, that distance away too, presumably. So, it's not necessarily the case, but it is a, it's a decent indicator. Yeah. Uh, do we want to talk about the day one execution meta? <laughs> yeah. So, th there's a meta that's very strong, especially online. Um, I found. I don't know if this is necessarily as much the case in a lot of in-person groups, but basically any online game I've seen, there's a meta where the clockmaker comes out day one and gets executed, just that you don't have to deal with deciding to execute someone uh, to satisfy the Vortox, uh, since you know somebody has, to die, somebody has to be executed every day in a Vortox game, and you don't know if it's a Vortox game on the first day, so you want to execute somebody just to be safe. It's very often the clockmaker. There's certainly pros and cons to this like there's a reason this meta has developed it's useful in some situations and i personally think that it's way overused what do you what do you think about it <laughs> i think i yeah i understand why it's sort of the same thing as executing the top four characters in trouble brewing because they only get their information once they already have it and it helps you prove that they're good it doesn't strictly prove that they're good but boy is it a tough is it a tough sell for a minion to get themselves willingly executed on day one especially where unlike trouble brewing you don't really clear anyone i mean you mm -hmm. kind of clear your clockmaker number you know if you were bluffing as the clockmaker but that's eh, that's only so so uh, there's so many things that could go wrong with doing that so i, I understand where it's coming from i I think my biggest issue with it is that it sort of flies in the face of some of the strongest advantages that we've just outlined about the clockmaker, yeah. which is whether or not you they know that you're in the game. And I do truly think that keeping that information hidden for a while will get you a lot more benefit than just coming out with it right away, because it, it makes the evil team's job a lot more uncertain and... Anytime the evil team is uncertain, that's kind of a win for good because it means that they're 
guessing and hoping and praying and maybe making mistakes that they don't know that they're making. So I think that that's my biggest issue with it is, but it's almost more of a consequence of having come out right away with it that then everybody goes, Oh, well, you're the clockmaker. We should kill you. So I feel like perhaps if you can find a way to jump on the execution grenade without explaining why. Yeah. That's, that's what I was just about to say. Like, well, first of all, there, there's there's the trade-off that if you're getting yourself executed, you're definitely not getting an evil person executed. But if you're willing to make that trade-off, then it's just it's probably, I think, based on what we've talked about here, I think that most of the time it's better to get yourself executed in a way that they don't know that you're the clockmaker, which can be difficult, especially if people are expecting clockmakers to want to die early. Then sometimes you just wanting to die on the first day is going to be a signal anyway that you're the clockmaker. But I do think that that most of the time will be a better way to do it rather than actually coming out as the clockmaker. Yeah, I think some ways that you could perhaps do it is sort of either bluffing or double bluffing where you can, you know, say that you're an artist and you've used your question Mm -hmm. and that you're going to keep your information secret, but that, you know, you're now expendable. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's yeah. it, it does a couple things. The, the danger there, of course, is that if there's a real artist, they might just call you on it immediately. Yeah. But you can always just say, well, I was just trying something, but still execute me. Because you, in truth, you don't really care if you die. It's more the exposure of your information that you don't want to get out. So it's not the end of the world to do that. Or you could say that you're the clockmaker get executed and then say okay guys actually i was the mutant i just wanted to get out of the game (laughs) and then maybe the the evil team will drop their guard a little bit and then you know a couple days later you go actually i'm kidding i actually was the clockmaker i just wanted to see if the evil team was gonna bite you know there's a few things like that that you can do with once per game abilities or abilities that you think aren't you know aren't gonna be a problem or or something like that um but there's not that many. A lot of the information in this set is is every night information. and uh, Or once per game, you know, um, uh, like a seamstress. You could bluff as a seamstress, too. Uh, but a lot of the characters are every night information. So you're going to have a very narrow <laughs> pool, and it's mm-hmm. only going to work so many times to do that. But I do think a big point that you mentioned is that you do know that you're good, right? It's, it's like being an outsider. You know that you're on the good team, even if something's yeah. making you look sus. And so I would try and push for people to make claims and see if somebody's suspicious. And then if they're suspicious, just kill them. Like <laughs> just cause you know, yeah, sure. Maybe, maybe they're trying something and it doesn't work out. Or maybe you just killed a minion, and then you can just zip the game up really fast with your clockmaker info. Yeah, and and something really interesting is that killing yourself as the clockmaker actually makes your own ability a little bit less strong, I think, because every execution of that where somebody else dies kind of makes your information better. You can often tell, for instance, when in a when a minion leaves the game through execution, like their ability just suddenly stops working. Suddenly the next day somebody comes out and like, oh yeah, I was targeted by the Serenovus this whole time and now I'm not anymore. Or you can even, like in an extreme case, you can do a witch test where everybody uh, everybody nominates. Things like that can allow you to discover when a minion has died. And so that means that if somebody gets executed and there is no indication that a minion has died, which, you know, could still be a minion, but maybe less likely if there are still other indicators of minions then that means that that's narrowing down your information. And so so if you're using that first execution on yourself, it's just making your own info a little bit less useful as well. Yeah, exactly. It's mu- yeah, much like the you already know that you can trust yourself. That also means that you can trust that you're not part of a pair. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's a that's another Yeah, you you don't need to be executed to know that you're not part of a pair. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And yeah, I I agree with that. And I think that it's difficult to justify killing a lot of those every night information characters. So that I think that's the major argument against mm-hmm. it. But man, if, if you can nail a evil team or help it so that your information like prioritizes people in the end, I think that that's pretty, pretty good. So yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I think there have been a lot of games where 
They haven't had a clockmaker in them, so there's not even been a chance for someone to do this strategy. I've seen the evil team just get destroyed right away by like the good team executing the pit hag or something, just like, kind of on a random chance, but like they were slightly suspicious and they just went for it because um, they needed to kill someone. And I've seen that just ruin the evil team so many times that I really feel like even if you have a clockmaker, it's still worth trying to go for that a lot of the time. Like, I, There's going to be a lot of things that I say on the show, especially this season, where I talk about some established meta and I talk about like all the reasons that I disagree with it Except the truth is, I don't always disagree with it. Like, sometimes you still do want to do this. Uh, I just think it's really good to, like... I'm I'm more pushing back on it because I've heard so many people do it as just, like, a default. I just think that you need to be considerate of it and, like, consider all the possibilities before making a decision to go along with something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. And Clockmaker is definitely... Really, actually, I think almost all of the once-per-game abilities in this set have things that a lot of people will tell you is strictly the only correct way to play something mm-hmm. and i think you and i both have feelings tm about that <laughs> um <laughs> so yeah uh oh i wanted to mention something that i had written down it's sort of this is sort of a non sequitur but it's before we're getting even to bluffing yet so um <laughs> we had mentioned that the information gets less useful if the demon is jumping around either it's a fangu or a barber swap uh a possible a possible tech you can use, and I know this sounds really boring, so I can understand why somebody might not want to do it, but if you are a philosopher, you can turn into a clockmaker mid or late game, and you get the first night info, but it will... I guess, does it have to be living demon? It probably doesn't. N- but I, nope, it does not specify that. <laughs> but I think I think in the rulebook, it actually says if something says the demon, it means the living demon, demon parentheses. So... Let me- I'm, hold on, I feel like I should actually look this up real quick. <laughs> I, I think I did look it up for this. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk and you can look. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, assuming that this works the way that I think it does, which is that you will get an information for the new Fangu or, it, you know, if you swapped, um, it will help. It'll help a lot more with a Fangu because if you, say, barber swap between a minion and a demon, it'll it'll quite possibly be the same number. Uh, but in a, a multi-minion game, uh, it could actually be a much smaller number, right? If you have, like, minion, player, player, minion, and then, like, several, you know, four seats away is the demon, and then they swap with one of those other ones. If your clockmaker goes from a, a four to a two, uh, that's a that's a pretty big piece of information. So, yeah, it, it's kind of a boring thing to use your once per game ability to turn you into an, a starting info character <laughs> but it could actually be quite a useful clue if you really have no idea who could be the likely culprit um, assuming you think that body swapping is happening in this in this game yeah all right cool i've been i've been verifying it it seems that you are correct it's it's the demon so it wouldn't count a dead demon and yeah, that that seems correct, unless they've changed that, and it's not up, updated in their rulebook yet. By the way, I wasn't really listening to what you were just saying, because I was looking this up, but I'm pretty sure I agree with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it was I was pretty much just going over what I said in the notes, so... Uh, okay, good. <laughs> I put in a few more uh, uh, hedges on, you know, assuming <laughs> this and assuming this in this potential, <laughs> but um, as, as one is wont to do in this set. Um, yes i think really we had two more things to talk about before bluffing uh one was mine and one was yours uh the, <laughs> i wanted to mention that and we've sort of covered this but your stock definitely changes a lot uh in multi-minion games versus single minion games just because if you're in a two minion game then each minion provides two people that are suspicious which means that there's now four people that are suspicious that could be the demon plus the two that are actually the minions so that's six people out of like a you know 10 or 11 person game it starts to be a lot less useful um of course obviously if people are dying such that they're canceling those pairs out, that does bring it back to being helpful again, but it's a lot less of a, of a gotcha in, in a large player game. 
Um, I, I think that the strongest thing in a large player game is knowing like the minimum distance. So like if you get a three or something, you know that like you don't have to be looking at people sitting next to each other. Uh, if your information's true, of course. So like knowing a minimum distance is still pretty helpful. But other than that, it's a lot more muddied. That can be sort of deceptive, though. I do want to warn against taking the truth of your ability, but then perhaps talking yourself out of doing something that is actually correct, which, so let's Mm. say that you've got a two minion game. Well, if both of the minions are sitting next to each other and the demon is, say, three away from one of them, it doesn't mean that the minions aren't sitting next to each other. And so if you look at that and say, well, we just executed minion A, so we know that his neighbors can't be the demon. Yeah. (laughs) I think the natural inclination is to stop looking at them with suspicion, but that's not really... (laughs) That's not really true, and so I think mm-hmm. you can sort of psych yourself into an incorrect uh, logic chain if you don't bear in mind that it really doesn't clear those people of being evil. It just clears them of being the demon. But if you're trying to use your information to catch the demon, then you still really need to be looking at everybody. Um, yeah. Yeah, for so sure. That's, I think that's the main danger of, of that type of thing. But you are right. It at least narrows down who is or isn't the demon. Uh, another thing I think we skipped over a little bit is that getting a one in any game, if you don't know what the demon type is yet, getting a one means that a Nodashi's reach could be extended. So if if the Nodashi is sitting next to a minion, their poisoning is going to skip over that person. And just having a one is means that you should be keeping that in mind, that if you're later in the game hunting down a Nodashi, you should actually be looking for the poison extended a bit further away than just one person. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point, and something... I hadn't thought about enough to be crystallized into a specific point. And it's very, I always love those types of quick things to remember as like, but you may have had to have thought to get there in the first place. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. It's just like every little way that you can say, oh, well then that means this is true. Given these other preconditions just like helps you be more and more certain of who's telling the truth. Yeah, so like if if there's ever a narrative in that game where people are saying like, well, these two people are poisoned, the person in between them must be the Nodashi, then you can immediately be like, well, no, that's not possible because that either means I'm poisoned, but how did I get poisoned if I'm not next to the Nodashi? Uh, you know. Right, or if you get say like five people in a line all claiming false information, or maybe not five people, but like like several people all in a line creating or talking about false information, it could be that the outermost two are the poisoned ones. And yeah. then <laughs> like, you know that, you know, maybe there's another minion in there and then the minion might just, the minion right next to the demon might just be saying, oh, false information. And then if you throw in an outsider or something, Right, like you can you can sort of unpack that from a this must be a no dashi game. All right, I mean this must be a vortex game because too many of us are wrong. Well, if the pattern of them is all either in a line or in a line with a few unknowns of that might be outsiders, then it might actually get you back on the right path for which demon you have to yeah, worry about. Um so we kind of mentioned a lot of these, but I wanted to go over quickly some of the characters that you can coordinate with to make your info better there is and by the way it's almost all of them so uh <laughs> yeah. spoilers uh, <laughs> uh the first two i thought of were flower girl and town crier because those are both going to help you hunt for the minion demon and oftentimes if you're deliberate about how you organize nominations and votes and stuff and if you can get the town to go along with it you can you can kind of stretch that information out a little bit more like if you use the flower girl to narrow it down to one physical half of the town then that might tell you about like corresponding pairs on the other half or something like that. Um, Town Crier can be similar. I put Dreamer on this list, but that's mostly just because Dreamer is really powerful and kind of goes with everything in the game. Dreamer is just completely overpowered. Uh, <laughs> artist, you can certainly have them ask a question to try to uh, help you figure out your information. Seamstress uh, tells you about players' alignments, so that can be good. Snake Charmer kind of works. Uh, obviously, you have to trust them first, which is always difficult. You trust but... them and have them actually be telling anybody anything. Yeah. yeah. And if a Snake Charmer has hit the demon, though, um, the former demon coming out, you can help to verify them 
by if they tell you that their minions are the correct distance away from them. That can be a really, uh, you can you can really help verify the snake charmer in that situation. This is also a little bit more of a point uh, in favor of what we talked about with not disclosing your clockmaker info right away. Yeah. Because if you do that, then it can just be a strong minion bluff that, you know, oh, well, I know the clockmaker exists, so I'll <laughs> just throw people under the bus that are the right number away. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, there's just a little sub note on that, but yeah. Yeah, we already talked about how Oracle helps. I think Oracle actually, I don't know, the more I think about it, the more it feels like Oracle should be like the strongest helper, but like it I said, is I assuming there's no shenanigans. Out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I Sage is also trouble. really good. Yeah. But yeah, like I said, pretty much everybody in this, in Saxon Violets is helping you get information about who is evil to some extent. I think Sage is actually extremely powerful because of being able to then correlate it with your yeah. number, right? You're like, oh, well, it's one of these two people. And we already had suspicion on this person, which means, you know, it's almost certainly this one of that pair. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. But yeah, I think the I think the really interesting thing one to keep in mind there are the snake charmer and then the other ones who you can actively coordinate with. I think uh, not that this is a dreamer episode, but I do think that the dreamer is most powerful on really just the first two nights of the game. Because I yeah. think that most storytellers will tend to show the bluff that somebody's going with. So yeah, yeah. it sort of tells you because you're getting, but like you're getting minion or demon reads on everybody. <laughs> so if you have a clockmaker in the game, your storyteller might just be throwing minions on a lot of people and then like the demon on a couple other people, but it, to a point where it becomes difficult to coordinate with a dreamer unless they get a really early ping of somebody obviously lying about their role so yeah i think the dreamer is actually ironically even though the dreamer is very strong i think it's actually one of the harder ones to coordinate with on this list that's fair yeah i I do think that the dreamer is just so powerful on its own though that like (laughs) it's still gonna be really good a lot of the time yeah i i think the biggest thing about the dreamer is that it's almost impossible to bluff (laughs) <laughs> which makes yeah. it which makes it very trusted just because of the difficulty of it because it's so easy to just lie to somebody about your role much like an undertaker right if yeah. you're if you're bluffing undertaker and you're not a spy you know boy it's gonna be hard as soon as somebody asks you and and they haven't been truthful about what they are they just yeah but even with that like you have to then execute them first so you have to get to that point first with the dreamer there's like no cost to to checking them kind of oh yeah i just meant in terms of the difficulty of bluffing it's very difficult to bluff for the same reason but it's even more difficult to bluff which means you almost always trust it anyway yeah anyway um but that's 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 the dreamer episode somebody else can talk all about that (laughs) later (laughs) yeah all right. Um, anything else we wanted to talk about with the playing as the clockmaker? I don't. I don't think so. I think. I think we mostly nailed at least all the things that I had thought about as as sort of main, uh, main, main sticking points. All right. So let's move on to section two: bluffing as the clockmaker. This section, I think, will go a little bit quicker, maybe. <laughs> no, uh, so well, some of these sure. things we've sort of touched on. So yeah. I yeah. Think, yeah. So the first the first big point you put in here is that much like bluffing the empath or the chef, even. Uh, the evil team knows if you're lying if you don't guess the right number. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if it isn't a Vortex game. <laughs> yeah, I think that bluffing, if you're going to bluff as the clock clockmaker, you should just not say your number. <laughs> because <laughs> you say, we'll tell you later. But throwing out a BS number, the evil team... Not only does the evil team know whether you're lying with your number, they also know whether you should or shouldn't be poisoned. So mm-hmm. it's sort of a double whammy on that. And in a Vortox game, if you guess the correct number, then they actually know you're lying because, <laughs> like, yeah. Um, there's just too many ways for the evil team to know that you're lying if you are if you throw out a number. Uh, and even it also kind of short circuits you if you are a real clockmaker and you give out a false number because they also know that that's not true. Yeah. I, I guess you could do that to make it look like you are another character bluffing his clockmaker, <laughs> uh, I guess, <laughs> but... Well, I mean, actually, yeah, I guess the big difference between that and, like, Chef giving out a wrong number intentionally is that in Trouble Brewing, they don't know if the Chef is drunk, whereas in this, they do know pretty much with certainty whether or not you're poisoned. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, exactly. There's There's too many factors that they know who is getting bad information or whether the information is correct for something as explicit as that 
most of the other characters can get away with fuzzing their information because either it's something that the evil players don't know for certain or stuff but <laughs> yeah i think it's it's very challenging to sell a bluff as a clockmaker uh with a number yeah or yeah our second point was the uh was actually the if you're the mutant and you uh want to yeah. die you can bluff that you're the clockmaker and not give your number and then tell them you're the mutant later um yeah, That'll... we kind of we talked about the inverse of that to some extent. <laughs> yes, yeah, that would be the double bluff, uh, which is kind of fun. I kind of like that that has that duality. Like the character that would want to bluff as you is also a good character to pass off that you were bluffing about your bluff. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I kind of like that. It, again, keeping the evil team unsure, and you're not throwing any shade on anybody at least until you reveal your number. Uh, so the good team, even if they're confused by what you're doing, they're not going to be sniffing up the wrong tree or barking up the wrong yeah. tree, uh, which is actually helpful. I think that's one of the big dangers of bluffing too hard as a good player, as another good player. <laughs> yeah, so if if you are the, the mutant and you just want to get yourself executed without having to rely on the storyteller, like, you know, going along with it, just, just get yourself executed as a fake clockmaker claim. This is assuming that... uh. That, that your group is really bloodthirsty for clockmakers. Uh, <laughs> I think it's an easy sell, though. You know, for all yeah. the reasons that it is the meta, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, I already have my information, and uh, this will prove that I'm good. And that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not it's not a it's not a hard lift. Do you want to talk about like the mid game reveal bluff as clockmaker? So kind of like how a real clockmaker might come out mid game and be like, oh, I have this information that solves everything. As a good player, what, do you ever want to bluff that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can see that with, depending on what your character is, uh, I wrote down a couple examples like Dreamer, Artist, Juggler, Savant, which is actually a lot of characters too, but uh, um, characters that, especially if you're one of the ones like the Savant or the Dreamer, where you're continuing to get information, it can be one of those things where for the same reason that the town does want to execute you early because your information is no longer relevant, the evil team doesn't really care about killing you because your information is not going to get updated. So mm -hmm. it can be a good way to sort of hide hide your role but still get your information out there surreptitiously and get shade thrown the way that you're pretty sure your abilities are pointing to. Uh, there's there's a little bit less reason to do it as an artist or a juggler because you've already used your ability in either case, but uh, it can be used also just as sort of a social a social bluff, I guess. I mean, it's obviously a bluff, but it's uh, as a way of pushing your narrative by pretending that you have information when you're just pretty sure on social read. Yeah, I, I think that there's a pretty big difference here between Sex and Violets and Trouble Brewing, where... In Trouble Brewing, any of the ongoing information characters can kind of solve the game on their own to some extent, I've found. I think that's much less true in Sex and Violence. Like, you really need information from the group as a whole. So I think it's going to be a lot rarer to find yourself in the situation where you're pretty sure of this clockmaker pair without being the clockmaker, because that kind of requires you to have solved the game mostly on your own. Yeah, I agree. I, I do think... I guess the situation I'm more imagining is when have you ever had those games where you're just so sure who it is <laughs> and people just aren't buying it? Yeah. <laughs> like it's so I'm sort of talking about those situations where you maybe you're not actually mechanically sure, but boy, are you pretty sure that you know who it is and just making up some information that supports that is more the case, I think, than. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. But but there is reason as as a a savant, for example, to perhaps do that just so that people don't, you know, I mean, people are going to see you talking to the storyteller, but you can always say that you're doing that to cover for real savant. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. Anyway, I I that was mostly what I was thinking about. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. All right, let's talk about it as the evil team then, bluffing as the clockmaker. <laughs> I think that the big thing here to start off with is that if the group wants to kill clockmakers, this is a risk. <laughs> yeah, this is a big risk for yeah all the reasons we've outlined. But hopefully they're not. <laughs> or hopefully or you hope can convince them, or or use it the way that we're saying that you know you can use the clockmaker effectively, which is to stay quiet about it and then come out later 
and then when you're later in the game, uh, the town is just in general much less happy to murder people that they are pretty sure are good <laughs> because they have so many fewer executions left to get it right. And I think that would be your your call. I've seen several of the streamed games where you've got people in the finals that are sort of spent characters and people are sort of saying, well, why why haven't we killed them yet? And it's like, well, you didn't kill them because they didn't come out on day one. And then by day three, you were starting to get really afraid that you weren't going to kill the demon. There's only so yeah. long you can kill people that you think are good <laughs> before you just run out of time. And so I, I think that would be your major in, but you're absolutely right. There's going to be a lot of people that are just going to campaign to kill you because why not? Um, yeah. And, and I think that after day one is really the key because also after day one, you have dead players who you can kill uh, for the sake of satisfying Vortex. So there's not quite as much of a need to just like sacrifice someone. You can always just re-execute a dead body. But yeah. I, I do think that it's going to be a much stronger minion bluff for those reasons. Uh, because obviously, if you, if you die as the demon, you just lose in this set. Uh, but as as a minion, it can be helpful, especially if your ability is not easy to spot. Like a witch, especially. Uh, mm -hmm. They may they may make this play early on and people don't know that the minion is gone. They just think either the witch is cursing the wrong people, uh, mm -hmm. which happens all the time. I've seen games where the witch gets no kills or that it's a pit hag and they're doing some crazy shenanigans with the evil team. This is more true in large player games than, uh, than small player games. But uh, if you, if you do that, people might just think it's a bad luck witch and then you can sort of you can sort of use that to give cover to your demon by giving them giving out a wrong number but being happy to die uh it, it's kind of like bluffing washerwoman in in trouble brewing right you die right away but assuming there's no undertaker you know it may actually just cover your demon the whole game so there there's some there's some upside but it's tough <laughs> I think the other tricky thing is that if you do come out right away, you have to come up with a good number right away, and you don't really know what's going to fit into the overall narrative yet. So that can be pretty tricky. I think that coming out later is also a bit more beneficial for that reason, because you want to ideally have a number that supports the wrong theory, whereas if you just throw out a random number at the start that you know isn't the truth, but or maybe is the truth if you know it's a Vortex, but it won't necessarily help you as much as um, throwing out like the perfect number to make people believe exactly what you want them to believe later on. Yeah, I actually think giving out the truth in a non-Vortox game is actually a pretty good idea because much yeah, like... Yeah, you are the minion. <laughs> yeah, you are the minion, and it it means that people are going to trust the two people on those pairs more because they know that at least half of their <laughs> team would be dead. Uh, it, it helps you build a narrative, but uh, I think also you touched on an important point, which is that you really should know whether it's a Vortox game or not, and that's very dangerous to be shooting off the hip, uh, <laughs> because it seems rare in this set that you can convince people it's not a Vortox game when it actually is. That would really require a lot of one-time-only information characters or the repeat information characters dying extremely quickly to craft a narrative that it's actually yeah. a Nodashi game. That's actually that's actually in an interesting thing that I haven't really thought about, but it's, it is true that when it is a Vortex game, I've almost always seen everyone figure it out. Yeah. When it's not a Vortex game, sometimes they're still not sure whether or not it's a Vortex game until the end, so maybe it's worth just having a rule of thumb that if you're not sure, it's probably not a Vortex game. <laughs> yeah, I think that... I. <laughs> especially with people that may be listening that haven't played this set as much. And to be fully honest, I haven't played it that much either, but it, the Vortox seems like it's something that should be really hard to figure out or really hard to like really worrisome. But I've found that usually you can get enough people, even just people on opposite sides of the circle saying that they have bad information is almost all you need. Right. Yeah. Like, because <laughs> There's almost no way that a Nodashi will reach that far. And once you know that you have a Vortox, like, then you know. And, and I mean, yeah, it's it seems like it should be hard, but there's actually not that much poisoning 
otherwise and especially not on day one i think Mm -hmm. the biggest piece of this is that it's day one discoverable which is why i actually think the vigor mortis is sort of a very interesting thing because you don't know when they actually kill their minion and so you don't know whose information starts being wrong unless it's really obvious that it's being wrong yeah the vigor mortis is terrifying demon to play against although in practice it often ends up not being that bad (laughs) Uh, yeah i yeah i think so too um (laughs) but yeah anyway it's yeah it's surprisingly kind of easy to tell if you have a vortex game when you have a vortex game i think i think you're right i think there's some when it's not a vortex game maybe if enough of the minions and then plus the poisoned players if they exist start having questionable information you can't tell if it's 50% 50% questionable, 50% true, <laughs> or 100% false, and, you know, but, yeah. Anyway, uh, I kind of lost the thread of what we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but basically, just so just keep that in mind before you make your bluff. If, you, if you're if you going to give a number and it's a Vortox game, you can either decide to make it fit in with that or go against it. And, yeah, just be aware that everyone's going to read into that. <laughs> Oh, I did uh, want to mention a play. It was actually done by somebody in our group uh, the with an evil twin. Um, the demon. Oh yes, I saw this in the notes. I this is this is going on my list of things to do in yeah, this game. <laughs> it, it actually, unfortunately, it didn't work, but it almost worked. It was very close. Uh, the well, that, demon... that's the thing with list ideas; they never actually work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was it was actually down to a, a really lucky. I'll explain the play in a minute, but the concept here is if you have an evil twin especially if it's a one minion game uh if the demon comes out as the clockmaker and tells the true number that's really a decent bluff because they can just say look i know this is incriminating me but it's also incriminating like this other person uh on the opposite side you know near the near the good twin uh of course you call them the evil twin but um and you can you can do a couple things with this. You can you can use it to th- try and make the good team suspicious of the good twin if you start burying kills after they execute somebody X number away from the good twin. Or specifically or I would say from the evil twin, right? No, because if you stop doing kills when say your clockmaker number is a oh, two. Oh no, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you <laughs> want it to make it look like the good twin is the evil twin. Uh, by stopping killing once you kill somebody, say, two spots away from the good twin, and the only thing keeping the game going is that the twins are there, and it's sort of like throwing shade on a on a saint, right? Uh, yeah. Saying you get, for, you know, fortune teller and empath both, you know, uh, cross <laughs> crossing the streams on your saint. But if you can make it look like you've killed the demon in clockmaker steps away from the good twin then you can go by execution that way and it also gives you some cover that why would i you know why would i incriminate myself (laughs) with (laughs) with this number i mean i i guess i could be but it sort of narrows it to three people that are all wrong and also yeah three people that are all wrong and also giving you a potential of executing a good twin for the win you also don't even have to give the right number i think you can just give a random number oh that's true and it would still work out. <laughs> I think the biggest danger with that is that then people will be a little bit more execution happy on you, <laughs> where they go, well, okay, let, let's uh, let's just kill you to make sure it's not a Vortox game. Uh, yeah. <laughs> whereas if you're incriminating yourself, it gives a little bit better cover that like, yeah, I know it looks makes me look you know shady, but what, you know why would I do that? Um, yeah. So I think that's just a really interesting thing. Like you say, like uh, the. Oh, the minion and the demon are next to each other. Well, we know where the, one of the, the evil twin potentially is. Let's try killing people next to them. You kill someone next to the good twin, you stop killing people. Now everyone thinks the demon's dead. It's so good. Love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and it really only works with the evil twin because they're so public. Uh, yeah, it's sort of turning that to your advantage instead of uh, being a disadvantage. Uh, the only reason it didn't work in our game was that the demon did exactly that, but on night one, I had done sort of a a YOLO seamstress on two (laughs) random players, and it was the demon and somebody else. Oh, okay. And I got that they were on the same team, but I was worried that it was a Vortox game. Mm -hmm. And so I started a conversation with the two of them right away and said, hey, I seamstressed you guys. 
and you're on the same team and we have an evil twin so that means you must be on my team and you know then he the demon came out as a as a clockmaker made this bluff and then i said okay cool can i talk to just you and like i trust you for other reasons uh, a little bit more and so then i was talking to the demon and i said well you just incriminated yourself uh <laughs> so i tend to think that this if this is a vortex game then that means other player is like maybe not trustworthy for other reasons mm -hmm. so that would mean that your information is wrong you, like if your information is wrong then it's probably him and if your information is right then we know the other person that it must be right is yeah. like two away from the the good twin and it the own the problem was that the player that wasn't the demon did have pretty good confirmable ish information and so then i just flipped it and i was like oh uh oh <laughs> that's bad <laughs> news for you demon because now i trust this guy oh oh and he got himself killed because i explained to him what was happening and he goes oh if you think i'm the demon just kill me right now i was like okay okay well now <laughs> we've got a problem because there's only yeah. two evil players and <laughs> like <laughs> so yeah it was... I, I have information about four of them <laughs> yeah exactly so uh it did end up the the seamstress but if i had picked any other good player uh instead of the demon that would have been hard to un to unwind so yeah i think it can be a really strong play and like even if the group's really cautious and doesn't want to like execute the good twin right away they still like by the time you like they might execute enough other people and then you can just like suddenly come back into the game as the demon and kill down and like you they have like one day to figure it out or something <laughs> right that that's one of my favorite things as like a really like aggressive play to do as the evil team is just to stop killing as the demon and bluff that you're dead. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love that play. The uh, I'm totally there's a, good a zombie to do play. It. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we had that a lot in Bad Moon Rising. It was like <laughs> every game was a zombie game because every min every demon was pretending to be a zombie, especially yeah. if it was a Poe. But anyway, that's there's a there was a lot of that of pretending to be the demon or pretending to have died. And or every I, game was a mastermind game for the same reason. Uh, I think I sink kills too much in general in like any game I'm playing. I sink kills in Trouble Brewing, Bad Moon Rising, Sex and Violets, all of them. <laughs> just I probably do it too much, but I really enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty much all our points on bluffing as evil, right? Like, yeah, it's dangerous. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much TLDR. It's dangerous. Uh, all right, let's talk about running the clockmaker as the storyteller. Then uh, this is mostly straightforward, I think. But there's a couple things to be cautious of and a couple of really weird situations that can happen. Do you want to start? <laughs> sure. I uh, This is really sort of just a summarization of the things that we've already talked about. But uh, if you put in a clockmaker in a game with only one minion and it is an evil twin and it is not a Vortex, <laughs> which sounds like a lot, but it's really not that crazy, especially if you're randomizing, right? Because it's yeah. one in four minions and three out of four demons uh mm -hmm. so really it's actually not that crazy at all uh that it's really a lot of information to be giving a lot of correct information to be giving a clockmaker for all those reasons we just outlined with the bluff and with the using your ability in conjunction with an evil twin where <clears throat> two players are coming out as saying one of us is a minion that really helps you triangulate on who the other who the demon candidates really are and if your information isn't false that i mean that's pretty much it so it i would just say be careful if you have that situation because evil is just going to be outing themselves and there's no one else yeah. it can be uh that was really that was really my main thing because there's no choice you have as a storyteller other yeah. than whether you put them in the game or not Oh, and, and by the way, actually, I was just, I just thought of this on the thing we were just talking about in the previous section. Uh, even in that situation, if they, if you can always be like, look, if you don't trust me, you can just kill me because in that situation, you're trying, you're hoping that they're just going to execute the good twin and you're pretending you're dead anyway. So it's not that bad if you actually are dead. Sorry. I just wanted to throw, throw that in there. The danger <laughs> there is if you give the right number, then they know which twin to execute because the kills will stop. <laughs> Once That's true, but I'm yeah, but like if if you if you have already stopped the kills after they've like killed someone next to the good twin. Oh sure. 
if you've already stopped the kills, then it doesn't matter that much if you actually do die, <laughs> if they already think it's the wrong person. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could give the number that's the distance between you and the good twin. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then like, <laughs> then make people question whether or not you're giving your minion cover or, yeah, yeah. The, there's a few things you can do there too. But it, the danger of getting yourself killed before you've started sinking your kills is that it's a pretty strong indication that you are the demon and then... Yeah, but yeah, it's still. All right, but anyway, uh, back to the thing with the evil twin clockmaker being a strong setup. I think that a lot of the time this isn't really going to get like put the good team in that much of a better position, because this is a super strong thing that evil can bluff any time. There's an evil twin, and this just kind of goes back to the thing I've been saying about sex and violets, which is that you, the evil team has to be making these more aggressive bluffs and. If the evil team in general is making aggressive bluffs like this, they can either do aggressive bluffs to get around this, where even even if you've narrowed in on the demon, they can still break the game in other ways that are even more distracting and won't, will make it kind of irrelevant. Or they can just bluff this often enough as their own thing, as like a really strong way to like direct the kills early on in the game, uh, that you can't always trust it right away. Yeah, that's true. I, I think there's also the potential of having some escape hatches, like a barber, um, mm-hmm. or you know, if you're a multi-minion game, having a pit hag uh, alone makes this not much of a problem as well. But you're also right; yeah. you can you can just aggressively bluff as as clockmaker also to sow doubt. Um, I see. Also, you have here making the evil twin the clockmaker's evil twin, which is funny. Um, yeah, that's that's <laughs> kind of a way to. I don't know if I'm not sure if that makes the setup more unbalanced or more balanced but <laughs> that is an option if you do want to just randomly set up and you happen to draw this you can always consider making the clockmaker be the be the twin i feel like if i did that i would as the demon just stop killing as soon as you killed like either people's number away from yeah the other person and just be <laughs> like we'll just leave it up to chance for who the town believes <laughs> like, <laughs> i feel like that might be uh, just, just really, just go on the fifty-fifty and hope that nobody, <laughs> hope that you don't have a dreamer. I guess that's your real, your real yeah. problem, right? I, I think the other good thing there, though, is that um, the that immediately gives the evil team the knowledge that the clockmaker is in the game, so that they can at least kind of play around it in different ways if they want to. Mm-hmm. Um, that's true. So, the evil twin isn't is like a weird information character in its own way. Yeah, I actually really like that about the evil twin that it. It it sort of gives you a washerwoman information yeah. for the evil team. You're like, yeah. <laughs> oh well, I know who this is. So, uh, anyway. is the evil twin really just an evil washerwoman? <laughs> <laughs> uh, play uh, custom scripts to find out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's talk. What, what about uh, putting the clockmaker in a vortex game? What kind of information do you generally give there? Do you have any rules of thumb or anything? <laughs> I don't know that I have a rule of thumb. I think that. I think that there's a temptation for storytellers to give a number that's only one different, but I actually think it could be kind of fun depending on, again, this is going to depend a lot on what the seating order actually is. And this may come down to how many other sort of triangulation abilities you might get when done that way. But I think I would probably avoid doing the one away um, or one off of the real number uh, just because or at least avoid it as an always strategy because that's Mm -hmm. almost too good. You could definitely just give them something big, right? Like six, (laughs) you know, assuming (laughs) that the number's like two, you know, you just give them one and, and like, yeah, it's sort of a gimme that it's a Vortox game, but as we've sort of discussed, especially when you have lots of players, people are going to know it's a Vortox game really early. I don't know. But at the same time, that feels kind of like you're being punitive by making a player's only ability be completely worthless. So yeah, that's why I, people aren't doing that. There, are, there are interesting things you can do, like give the number that is like opposite the circle from the clockmaker. If it, if there happens to be one of those numbers that will narrow it down to exactly one person who's opposite them, that can make it so that they have to decide, like, oh, am I just going to trust this person blindly? Uh, assuming if it's not a Vortex game, or if it is a Vortex game should i trust them still anyway or is that a strong indi- is that an indication that they are actually evil so there can be little things like that you can also do you could also like give them in a more than one minion game you can give them a number that is t- to a different minion so if mm. the closest minion is two you could give them say a four if it's actually a four where Ooh, that's, that's not quite true information but like 
it yeah i don't know it, it might be one of those things where you could sort of meta the storyteller much like when you have a, a drunk washerwoman a lot of people will sort of suspect that one of the players that they see is evil and that it's a minion or a demon bluff but using that to your advantage as a storyteller where you're actually kind of throwing them a bone well i mean i guess you could do that the other way too but you're kind of throwing the good team a bone if they start looking at numbers like that or something like that uh is yeah, something that, you that, do that makes it so that if they don't figure out it's a vortex game somehow then the clockmaker could still be really useful if they do figure out it's a vortex game clockmaker's now all of a sudden right twice a day <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If they do figure out it's a Vortox game, then that might mislead them because they might figure out that that person's the minion and then be like, okay, well, we know the demon isn't four away from them or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's kind of what I was. Yeah. That's sort of a fun, not exactly a trap, but it's sort of a fun, true, but not accurate, which, yeah. <laughs> which I like a lot. I like a lot of those misleading pieces of information that aren't just flat out fabrications. Um, but aside from that, I haven't given it a ton of thought. I Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's that important, but those are things to consider. Also, Clockmaker sitting next to an Odashi. Uh, I personally like giving them a one in that situation. <laughs> uh, I think that's... I'm not obviously not always going to do that, but I, I like giving them a one because then, like I was saying earlier, um, whatever number you get, you can kind of trust those people more and... Yeah, it's just going to be, it's going to make it kind of harder for them to figure it out. It's like, oh, maybe I should trust my neighbor. And if I can trust my neighbor, then they're, then they're not an Odashi. But if they are an Odashi, then I can't actually trust my information, which means I can't trust them. So, <laughs> Right. Yeah, I think that that, yeah, it's really interesting. I always feel like the Nodashi is actually really weak just because it poisons exactly two players and a traceable distance. Um, yeah. So that's that's definitely a danger of that but i mean at the same time it doesn't yeah i don't feel like giving them a one i feel like that's kind of the most confusing thing you can give them in a nodashi game when the nodashi isn't actually next to their minion yeah yeah that's true because that just creates the most misinformation about where the nodashi is so that's i think going to help the nodashi the most a lot of the time yeah i think so too i think i think you're right about that um it's yeah it's it's just uh it's gonna be hardest for you to tell that you're poisoned i think also with, yeah. a, with a very reasonable number uh which can help hide the presence of a nodashi when maybe one other player comes out as poisoned but mm -hmm. I, I will also say that having a clockmaker next to nodashi in general i think makes the nodashi stronger because it's harder to figure out that the clockmaker is poisoned than most other characters i think yeah that's exactly what i was sort of getting at is that is that it'll be hard to tell and then their say their rightmost neighbor will will sort of figure out that they're poisoned but then the town will be on a hunt of like well who's the other poisoned person yeah yeah i i agree with that um it really all the once per game abilities are that way but especially that because the clockmaker has such a limited the it, unverifiable in a lot of ways piece of information or you could give them the truth i guess and then truly hide the fact that they're poisoned uh yeah actually that, that's something that's more of a Nodashi discussion about when you should give their poisoned neighbors the truth to make it that it's not obvious where the Nodashi is. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. There's, there's one more thing specific to Clockmaker as storyteller that I think uh, doesn't come up often, but when it does, you might be very confused. And that is, what do you tell the Clockmaker when there are no minions or possibly no demons in the game? This is a situation that can arise in a valid game state. For instance, if the Pit Hag has turned... Like, if the Pit Hag is the only minion and they turn themselves into a Snake Charmer or something. Now there is literally no minion in the game. And let's say a Philosopher then turns themselves into the into the Clockmaker. What do you tell them? <laughs> it's, not, it's not like I Zero think is a, correct. <laughs> I mean, Zero is not incorrect, though. It, it is, though. It's not... There's not... The, the minion and the demon aren't the same person. It's just that there's a demon. It's like undefined. There it is, is no undefined, minion. but zero is closest <laughs> to undefined. Yeah. There's I, no, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if there's an official answer on this. I asked around a little bit. I'm actually going to check back in on the, on the server because I asked about this this morning. No reason, but I have an important question about a character uh, that's on the podcast I'm about to be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think there's an official answer on this yet. I would imagine that there will be one eventually. Uh, this is something to watch the rulebooks on. 
But I'm pretty sure the correct thing to do is just to say either zero or maybe just shake your head no at them. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I feel like either way, you're going to get a storyteller conversation the next day. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is fine. Uh, the clockmaker on the fir- or when they, they're like, OK, so I'm the clockmaker. I didn't get any information. The storyteller just shook their head at me like they were disappointed in me or something. <laughs> I can't believe you've done this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. I mean, the good news is you don't have to worry about that on the first night on this script. There are yeah. other scripts, uh, potentially, <laughs> in, in air quotes, with special rules for how many demons or minions there are <laughs> and things like that. And I think that Part of the answer of that is if you're including the clockmaker, um, go in <laughs> forewarned, I guess. Uh, that would be a, what, a jinx, potentially? Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, but yeah, the interesting thing is that it can happen in a, like a real Sex and Violets game, just in the base set. <laughs> yeah, that's true. With with some, with some <laughs> finesse, uh, <laughs> it, it could happen. I also think it's funny, I guess. I hadn't thought about this, but now that I am. Uh, if you have a pit hag that's turning good players into minions, uh, Ooh, yeah. then that can affect a late game clockmaker. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> as as far as I know, anyway, could be the distance away from a good minion, which is yeah. perhaps starting to get less helpful than anything else. <laughs> but yeah, anyway. yeah. Well, now we know where three minions are. So what does this tell us? <laughs> <laughs> it tells us that yeah. I mean, actually, depending <laughs> on the number, though. Uh, it might actually tell you a lot. Like if the numbers That's are true. one, and there's only one of them that has an alive neighbor, then like, uh-oh. Yeah. uh oh. <laughs> so, but yeah, I I think that about I think that about covers it. There's not a ton of storyteller stuff you have to take into consideration. It's actually I think a little bit safer online where you can reassign roles before you, mm. people have seen yeah. them. Because if you get a really bad draw, right, you can just say like, eh. but in, in yeah. a real life game, there is no, no order. Know, yeah, there's no intermediate. There's no intermediate unless you, I guess you could just run your games that way where you say, yeah, which you is know, fine. I'll, I'll it's, shuffle it's the characters fun. and then deal them out to you, you know, but I know what the starting info is or something like, yeah, I guess you could do that. But yeah, you can do that. But it's more fun usually to let people draw them out of the bag, I think. Yeah, there's there's sort of an intrinsic Oh, like gambler thing <laughs> like what am i gonna get yeah that's yeah true. and also just feeling like the game isn't like rigged against you from the start or something is pretty important as a player yeah yeah i mean there's some trade-offs there obviously right because if the yeah. storyteller is going in knowing how things are they can sort of tailor it to be a little bit quote more fair but people are already a little bit uh controversial on how much the storyteller should tilt the scales anyway so mm-hmm. that's a whole different discussion all right, I think that about covers it. Thanks for having this chat with me, Justin. Yeah, thanks for having me on again. I really enjoy this game. I enjoy how many layers there are and how many of them sort of re resurface and overlap on top of one, one another uh, as your meta can shift back in and out of different play styles. And I especially love that something as simple as somebody who learns one number on one night Mm -hmm. at the start of the game can be talked about for uh, nearly an hour and a half and still have all sorts of interesting things to be considering. So anyway, 